for the Gyaneko sorcerer to perform this magic, that is a ritual magic at a distance, this involves no physical contact with the target, in order for that to work, your alignment, the alignment of the sorcerer with Gaia has to be absolutely superb and impeccable. And you come into that alignment by your understanding and exception of her ethics. You understand her ethics. Mm. You accept the rules of engagement as she herself has designed them. And why do we know what the rules of engagement between prey and predator are? Well, look at nature. Look at right. the great very cats. You see where I'm going with this? Oh, absolutely, John. Absolutely. I mean, I live in nature and I see things being killed by other things all the time. But, you know, that's the way it is. Um, sparrow hawks in the garden or whatever and they're absolutely magnificent and they have every right to be fed as well as the little chirpy birds that's right they do and you know when you when you watch that behavior in nature uh, have some humility you know and have some humility to understand that this is the symbiosis is part of the divine symbiosis of this planet. It's mm. not some cruel and unfair arrangement that some mistake that she made. Oh, how gruesome. Cats eat mouse. Cats eat mice, you know. <laughs> Excuse me, you know. No, you, no. You really have to look at it with sobriety and humility and realize this is to teach us because now is the moment for humanity to understand the prey-predator relation in the context of intraspecies predation. Mm -hmm. The exception, you know, the sparrow hawks may kill the sparrows, the cheetahs may kill the gazelles, but they don't massacre the whole species, do they? No. They don't do it wastefully and insanely and out of some kind of bloodlust, do they? No, no, absolutely not. And we don't do it in that way either, you see? No. So we have to learn from them how to do it. We have to have the humility to accept this teaching from the animal world. Yes, but, you know, I, I think that a non-acceptance of this prey-predator bond and relationship is also part of the uh, separation from nature. And, you know... It, People moving into the cities, they have no concept of how nature works anymore. And they're the ones that want to kill, don't want the foxes to be killed or, you know, whatever. It's That's silly. Right. But they go down and buy their hamburger, don't they? Yeah. You should go to an abattoir and see how cows are killed. Well, we kill, them, we kill them here ourselves, so I that, know. There you go, you see? And that's the way it was for our species for untold thousands of years before we got into this separation with the Industrial Revolution, you see? Yeah. And we really lost it then. Now, uh, we're coming back to it now in a way that we never knew before because we're coming back to it now because we have to come back to it. Mm. The interspecies predators, the global psychopaths, the control freaks uh, are not going to stop. Oh, no. Uh, you know, anybody who thinks that they can be stopped is is in serious uh, illusion. Anybody who thinks that they can be made accountable, that they can be brought to justice. I mean, what a joke. Brought to justice? you got to be kidding, you know. They, they know that they can't be stopped. So it's about time for us to know what they know. <laughs> Ah, oh, that's grand. That's grand. <laughs> well, thank you on that. Um, I'm just, I mean, I don't take this lightly, and that's why I, want, I wanted to give you an opportunity to say why this ethical framework is important and why the timing is important. Um, so I appreciate that. Well, thank you very much. I, as, as you surely know, uh, I don't take it lightly either, and I am ex ex exercising, uh, you know, meticulous care with this, and, and thank you for being my collaborator in that. Yeah, well, um, it's very obvi obvious you're taking me meticulous care, 
care as you should be. If you didn't, I wouldn't listen to you. So, you know. <laughs> Fair enough, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. On to something else. Um, back to astrology, and you might think this isn't applicable either, but, but you, you said that the archons reside in the rings of Saturn. Um, mm -hmm. And I was wondering if it would be helpful to see where Saturn is placed in our natal charts as a possible in indicator where we are most susceptible to our conic attack. And if so, would this, would this be an indicator where we must show our internal warriorship against them and possibly that would enable us to focus on what would be appropriate target in the outer world for use as a lethal kill? Sure. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as the last statement, but okay. I, would, I would say that there is some sense in, in it. I, I get a lot of sense in what you're saying here, but I'd like to sort of uh, take what you said and hold it in my hands and sort of turn it around to look at it in a different direction. Okay? Good. Yes, uh, please. First of all, uh, there are many things to learn about the formation of the solar system. For instance, one thing, and I don't know if I've said this before, maybe I just said it once on, on Grok, uh, a very close scrutiny of the Nankamadi texts, the cosmological texts, such as the origin of the world and the, uh, the reality of the archons and uh, things like that. There are about five, I think. Uh, indicates that uh, when Sophia inadvertently uh, produced the Archon uh, species, the, the, the horde of Archon cyborg uh, locust-like insects, uh, she was, uh, you know, pretty shocked and surprised by that because she hadn't anticipated that. And so the first thing she did, uh, she, but she didn't want to, to be occupied with them, frankly, uh, you know, so she gave them something to do, like putting kids in a playground or sending them to Disneyland, okay? Mm. And so what they did with their, their powers that she invested in them, they weren't really their own powers, which the, the text very clearly says the, the mother gave them the light of her intelligence and allowed them to think that it was their own. And so they busied themselves uh, she didn't know what she was going to do next. Uh, she didn't know what was coming next, but she had to get them out of the way. They were a huge distraction, as it were, at that point. Yeah. So she gave them, a, you know, the ability to create, construct a solar system for themselves, uh, kind of a Disney World type of thing, you know, celestial mechanics and, and things like that. And <laughs> they created the, 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 a, a kind of version, early version of the solar system, earlier version, in which there was no sun, but Saturn was at the center. What we now call Saturn was the center of what their solar system was that they created their, their uh, what's it like, their erector set kind of world, you know, that they made. Wow. In organic, okay? Yeah. And it collapsed. The whole system collapsed. It didn't hold together because they could pull it off. So <laughs> then they had she had to reconstruct a solar system for them, but this time she put more of herself into it, as it were, literally speaking. Yes, this, literally. Yeah. yeah. But this is still before the actual formation of the Earth. What she did was, well, it's a remarkable thing that the, that the Nagamati text, this is a point I'm making, that they would say that the first attempt to create a solar system by the Archons failed, and that then they made a second one, and in the second one, Saturn, which had primarily, uh, which had previously been the center, was replaced by the sun, and then Saturn became the defining or limiting planet of the solar system. This is a very interesting story, okay? Mm. Now, a very interesting story of cosmology. I haven't heard that one before, right? So mm. uh, it's going to be really interesting to follow this story because I am certain that in the next two and a half years, as correction unfolds, every single aspect of the pre- uh, terrestrial cosmology of the solar system can be understood, realized, uh, written down, described, discussed, and brought into human consciousness through her correction. Yeah. 
you know. And so we will learn more about the archons and Saturn and all those kind of things as this unfolds. Uh, but now to jump to the other aspect of your question, uh, is knowing about the position of Saturn in the horoscope going to show you where you're susceptible to archonic attack? I don't think so. In fact, I would, uh, I would propose this. If you were to look at where Saturn is positioned in the constellations, not in mm-hmm. the suns, you would have a clue as to where, how you can attack the archons. Ooh. Right. Ooh. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Now really? that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. It, turn it around. Let's turn this paragraph paradigm inside out and as pink says let's get this party started you know (laughs) okay (laughs) we're going to stop complaining about what the archons are doing to us i'm not suggesting that you're complaining but a lot of people as you know of the carpetbagger type are doing nothing but bitching and complaining and pointing fingers yeah 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 and 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 the way they hype the archons to the point of giving them credit for inventing the moon and hanging it in place is so grievously stupid that it's demeaning to even address it, you know? Mm, mm. But you have to address it once in a while. So we're going to turn right around. I'll say you look at where planet Saturn is situated in the constellations. It's going to give you the key to where you have the most powerful ability, powerfully concentrated ability to work against the archonic spell over the human race and to defeat it. That's the way to look at it. Oh, that's, that's incredible. Yeah, that, that is really incredible. I truly thank you for that. That's very insightful. You're very welcome. And if you need any uh, assistance in locating that or any comment on it, just email me, okay? I certainly will, John. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for all your uh, answers and for the discussion. (laughs) The co-creation. Yes, the co-creation. Thank you, Uranus Rising. John, we now have some questions from our notes. We do not have a structure to them, but I feel that they are important. So please pardon us as we wind our way through them. And next up, we have Lolly. John, I I just wanted to return us to the notion, the word desire, being, as you said, the force of alignment. There's something about this word for me that is so luscious and loaded, and it feels so big, beautiful, and just essential to life. Can you expand on this word desire beyond beyond the romantic sexual desire or false desire? Partly, I just want to hear you talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's uh, a lovely invitation, and I'm delighted to talk about it. In fact, right. it's my favorite subjects. Oh, and as a matter of fact, mine when too. I... Hmm? It's mine too. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's, let's hope there's more people have this share this feeling with us. Uh, when I received the term uh, of Guy Awakening in August of 2008, I was really set up for it before the actual moment of delivery, which was uh, very, very quick, as I say, it all comes down in a zip file. But I was set up for it and directed toward it by a number of uh, nudges. And uh, I got two nudges from the Shakti cluster, even before I knew what the Shakti cluster was, because I didn't have the syntax or the visionary design of the Shakti cluster until the download, you know, until the delivery. But in the exciting weeks leading up to that, when I was living through the most uh, wrenching and actually life-threatening 